welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. Secretary Blinken met with Foreign Minister Cho tae in Washington and discussed their concerns about North Korea's aggressive behavior, including its arms transfers to Russia. Secretary Austin also spoke with Minister Shin Won-sik and vowed to take strong action against North Korea-Russia arms deals. Today, we discuss ways to deal with the growing relationship between Russia and North Korea, as well as China. We're working together on virtually every major challenge that uh, we have to contend with around the world. That violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions, including its export of munitions and ballistic missiles to Russia. Most recently, North Korea has uh, sent long-range weapons to sow more terror among civilians. In the studio with me, Mr. Elbridge Colby, co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative, a Washington-based policy initiative. Mr. Colby served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development from 2017 to 2018. He is the author of the Strategy of Denial. Also joining us, Colonel David Maxwell, the Vice President of the Center for Asia-Pacific Strategy. Colonel Maxwell was a former military planner for the ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command. Welcome to the program. Great to be with you. Thank you, great to be here. Now, Mr. Colby, we continue to see evidence of military cooperation between North Korea and Russia on the battlefields of Ukraine. North Korea may want to advance this relationship, but what about Putin? Does Putin want to develop this relationship going beyond just receiving shells and ammunitions? Well, I think the answer is clearly yes. I mean, the meetings between uh, Putin and Kim Jong-un and the deeper cooperation that's evident all around suggests uh, a one-way trajectory of deeper cooperation. And that's not just North Korea doing acts of charity for Russia. I think we can expect the Russians to continue to do more. And we probably haven't seen the full evidence of what they're prepared to do for, with North Korea. Colonel Maxwell, it seems like North Korea is eager to expand this relationship with Russia. After Foreign Minister Chesney visited Moscow, North Korea said that they want to put the relationship with Russia on a new legal basis. Is it overreaction to worry that uh, Moscow and Pyongyang may revive the 1961 DPRK Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation and Mutual Assistance? Well, yes, I think we should be concerned. Um, I think that, uh, you know, they've had a long relationship. It's ebbed and flowed over the years. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Colby said, uh, that, uh, you know, the co current cooperation is really on a level that we haven't seen. Uh, and I think that, uh, that certainly North Korea wants to expand. They want to be, they want to really want to be a player on the world stage and a full partner in the axis of authoritarians and totalitarians. Uh, but I, I also don't think that they will ever have an alliance uh, on the same level as the ROC US alliance or the US Japan alliance, uh, because their alliance is really transactional. Uh, I think they both benefit from, uh, from South Korea, I mean, from North Korea selling uh, ammunition to uh, Russia. And we often be concerned with the advanced technology and, and support that Russia might be providing uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, but I don't think that it will ever be an alliance uh, that will ever be able to compete uh, with the alliances of the United States. Mm -hmm. Mr. Colby, previous North Korean governments used um, provocations to extract concessions from United States, but Kim Jong-un is not backing down, is driving up provocations and military capabilities to the maximum. And it's been argued that um, to change the calculus of Kim Jong-un, who thinks that the United States is only about rhetorics, the U.S. should actually take punitive actions to take kinetic actions against North Korea's high-level provocations. And um, Colonel Maxwell also wrote an op-ed about this recently. So do you think such actions would actually give fears to Kim Jong-un or actually trigger unnecessary escalation? Um, well, look, I think it's it's hard to say in the abstract. I mean, I think the, the United States and in particular South Korea should have a, a you know, posture of, of peace through strength. It's important to 
uh, demonstrate uh, not only will, but more importantly, capability to Kim Jong-un. Um, I am cautious about suggestions that we deliberately escalate uh, because um, most importantly, we are stretched already. I think we need to be, be very deliberate about that and we should not get ourselves into a position where we've escalated beyond the point where we are prepared to go. Mm -hmm. um, if a war, God forbid, does arise on the peninsula, we need to be prepared for it. In particular, South Korea needs to be prepared for it because the United States is primarily focused on China. So we just need to understand all of that before we decide to flap our wings. I'm, I'm not against flapping our wings, but we should do it deliberately. And I would just add, add to that, that uh, you know, we have never responded. Uh, we have not conducted a serious military response to anything North Korea has done since 1976. And it is our fear of escalation that really is what will create escalation. Uh, because Kim Jong-un continues to push the envelope. And I would add that a kinetic response uh, by the alliance should only be conducted in response to a violent kinetic uh, action by the North against the South. And so, uh, and we need to do that to really reestablish deterrence. Uh, so um, we don't respond to all provocations with violence, uh, but certainly a violent kinetic provocation that attacks South Korea needs a determined response. So, Mr. Colby, are you saying that in the case of Korean contingency, U.S. will not come to U Korea's defense? Because there are concerns in South Korea that U.S. actually may not come to Korea's defense because I, of China. I think the United States should and probably very likely would come to South Korea's defense con in not, uh, consistent with withholding our capability in case the Chinese move. Because if, as we've discussed before, if the United States loses a war to China, South Korea loses also because China will become the dominant actor uh, in Asia, and China will therefore have the ability to push South Korea around and enable North Korea to push South Korea around. So first and foremost, the United States must have the strength to face off directly against China. And the problem is, is that if we get deeply involved in a war on the peninsula against North Korea, that could use up a lot of our capabilities and to some extent our will and money and weaken us uh, in the event that China uh, uh, moves. And this is why I'm very concerned that what's really going on here is that China is encouraging countries around the world, Russia, Iran, possibly Venezuela, et cetera, implicitly or explicitly, directly or indirectly, to cause more problems for the Americans, to deplete our resources, to deplete our political will. And of course, you see here in this country with the greater skepticism about supporting Ukraine, that there's already war fatigue in this country after over 20 years of war in the Middle East. Another war in the Middle East is going on now. And so I'm, in, in particular, in the case of Peninsula, I'm very concerned that the Chinese are winking at or supporting directly or indirectly preparations by North Korea to potentially create a conflict or something like it on the peninsula that would tie the Americans down further and thereby open up uh, China's opportunity for something like a kill shot against the Americans centered on a war over Taiwan. Colonel Maxwell, isn't Mr. Colby's idea a bit different from the views that South Korea should um, rely on U.S.'s extended deterrence? Well, yes, I think, and I think we are committed to extended deterrence. I think there's, there's no daylight uh, now, especially with the nuclear consultative group, uh, you know, the Washington Declaration, there's no daylight on, on extended deterrence. And I think we will come to the defense of South Korea uh, without, without question. Now, Mr. Colby's points are very well taken, uh, and it is a challenge if we are faced with two simultaneous conflicts. Uh, and that is, that is really gonna be a challenge. Um, you know, we've looked at this before. I mean, when we go back to June of 1950, when we were in a very weak position, uh, the first action we took when Kim Il-sung invaded South Korea was to deploy the Seventh Fleet to the Taiwan Straits. Uh, and so it, it is not as if we have not uh, uh, looked at these conflicts before. Um, yes, we are stretched around the world. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but what makes a big difference is our alliance structure. And I think that's something that is very formidable uh, and something that is, uh, is what is going to bring success to the United States and to our, our mutual allies. Let me just say our alliance structure is, a, is an advantage in a lot of ways, but it's also a vulnerability because, of course, we are now vulnerable to our military forces being engaged around the world, including in Europe. There's a possibility many European leaders are talking about the possibility of the Russians attacking NATO. Of course, we have on the peninsula and then, you know, our close ally Israel is also uh, engaged in, in a conflict. Um, it's worth pointing out in 1950 that we had essentially a nuclear monopoly or something close to a nuclear monopoly against the Soviet Union. So we had total escalation dominance, basically. We don't have that today. So if we get in a war in the, in the peninsula and we get heavily engaged, 
Uh, I think that is probably going to leave us very vulnerable to a Chinese attack. And so I don't think the United States would actually do that. I do think there's daylight inherently. There's no daylight politically at the rhetorical level, but in reality, there's daylight. There's a very urgent situation in which North Korea's nuclear advances and ICBM advances, coupled with its conventional forces and its much closer relationship with China and Russia, mean that we are in very great danger. Mr. Colby, because of the concerns that U.S. may not get deeply involved in the Korean contingency, that's why there are growing calls in South Korea mm -hmm. to get their own nuclear weapons. Mm. I, look, I think all options have to be on the table in our discussions. I'm not advocating for that. I don't think that the Washington Declaration addressed the fundamental problems in extended deterrence. I think the reality is, is that if North Korea can destroy multiple American cities, it's unlikely the United States would take risks that would lead to that. And, and I don't doubt, unfortunately, the resolve of Pyongyang to use nuclear weapons. And I don't think it's very credible to say that we would destroy the North Korean regime if they use nuclear weapons, because that would lead to multiple nuclear weapons uh, launched at the, at the United States. So I think we need to address this together. You know, my point of view is geopolitics is more important than nonproliferation. Our alliance structure, which Colonel Maxwell pointed to, is very important. But we cannot break our alliance structure because of a fidelity to something that is good, nonproliferation. The world would be better if fewer countries had nuclear weapons. But we do have allies with nuclear weapons, the United Kingdom, France, India, et cetera. Colonel Maxwell, isn't there a contradiction in the concept of extended deterrence if South Korea has to fend for itself? Uh, yeah, well, I think that that could be uh, that could be viewed that way. But I think that uh, I, I, you know, I take uh, Mr. Colby's wise counsel. Uh, but I think we are committed to defense on Korea, and I'm reminded of Huang Zhang Yap when he defected in 1997. Uh, and more important than war is deterrence. And you know, we asked him why North Korea has spent all this money on its, uh, its military and has never attacked South Korea. And the response was that Kim Il-sung and then Kim Jong-il at the time uh, knows that they cannot defeat South Korea with U.S. support. Uh, not the U.S. only, but with U.S. support to uh, South Korea. And of course, that, and he also said that they believe that the U.S. will use nuclear weapons if they attack South Korea. So in that instance, it's an example that our declaratory policy works, but at the same time, it also explains why North Korea has been pursuing nuclear weapons since the 1950s. Well, uh, and they want to, you know, they, they obviously want to have that capability to deter us as well. I'm not disputing the, what, he, what Colonel Maxwell is saying about 1997, but we're not in 1997 anymore. The North Koreans have made enormous progress on their missile and nuclear programs, and the Chinese have embarked on a historic military buildup. In fact, General Cotton, the head of Strategic Command, said that they are in a breakneck nuclear breakout. And of course, the Russians are not the Russia of 1997. This is closer to the USSR, probably of 1998, 1982 or something like that. So we are in a very, very different world, and we need to address it accordingly. And I would just add that by saying that we would not support North or South Korea and an attack by North Korea because they could target U.S. cities is playing right into the hands of Kim Jong-un's political warfare strategy. I mean, I think, yes, we're concerned with war, but we also have to understand what all the revisionists and, and rogue powers are doing from a political warfare standpoint. Uh, and I think we are often blinded by nuclear weapons, by war, and we are losing in the political warfare fight. And that's where I think we, we really have, have to uh, up our game. Well, let me, let me address this, because this is very important. Because there is a very valid point that Colonel Maxwell is, is, is raising, which is that we should be sure that we message to Pyongyang and, and Beijing and Moscow resolve and the willingness to fight uh, together. And let me be clear, my position is we should absolutely support South Korea to the extent that we prudently can. The problem is, if you, if you end up in a situation of bluff, People can ultimately see that. And if they call you on your bluff, following through on that strategy is disastrous. Now, I would, I would recommend, I, I know that probably Koreans hear a lot from people who are very experienced and steeped in the U.S.-Korea alliance. That is not a representative of the majority of the American population. There's obviously, I'm sure, positive feelings about South Korea. But if a president of the United States is presented with the, the decision to use nuclear weapons on the peninsula and he will lose, say, five American cities along the western coast, I think, I think we can anticipate that the president would regard that with a, a great deal of skepticism. So we need to think about that before it happens. My view is we should be realistic, figure it out together, and thereby preserve the alliance in a more credible way. And I would just ask that if we did not come to South Korea's aid, would those five American cities still not be vulnerable? Uh, you know, by saying we would not 
uh, we would not aid South Korea in their defense, would that protect our cities? Uh, and I think that is uh, a gamble that I, I just don't think is, is worth taking. You have shown insights of how there may be some differing views in Washington regarding alliance and regarding contingency in East Asia. And I think our Korean viewers would conclude that they would need to uh, boost up their self-defense mm -hmm. in any case, in any case of contingency and in this world. Now, Colonel Maxwell, you've just returned from Korea and learned some new concepts. I understand that U.S. forces Korea is using an influence network to affect Kim Jong-un's decision making. Yeah, I was uh, privileged to be able to get a briefing from the Northeast Asia fusion cell uh, that uh, General Camera has established in U.S. Forces Korea. Um, and this is really a, a very sophisticated and complex uh, um, system that they're developing. It's a five-layer influence network, uh, geophysical layer, the logical layer, data layer, personal entity layer, and the cognitive layer. And of course, the geophysical is really about satellite, really about understanding on the ground what, what's happening. But the cognitive layer is where they're really putting a great emphasis uh, to understand decision making. Uh, and they are really taking a multi-domain uh, approach uh, to defining North Korea's global network, how it is using its illicit networks to uh, finance its nuclear and, and missile program. Uh, and then they are, are, by identifying that, uh, they can, of course, share information with, with partners, but really develop courses of action uh, that are really uh, about influencing decision-making. Um, and and this, uh, this is really about understanding uh, their illegal uh, activities from proliferation, the, they're profiting from proliferation, uh, from exported forced labor, uh, from malicious cyber activity, fraud, and other critical activities. And, and note the nexus of illicit activities, human rights, uh, cyber influence operations, and ultimately targeting. Now, um, Mr. Colby did mention about the alliance structure. Um, and I want to ask your views about this alliance structure, because there is a view in Washington traditionally that U.S., South Korea, and Japan um, respond together to the regional threats based on value-based alliance and economic alliance. On the other hand, there are views that it is not the time to invest more in the alliance because there are so many geopolitical risks and challenges out there. What are your views? My view is that, um, look, I think trilateral cooperation among the United States, South Korea, and Japan is good. It is not the primary place I would invest scarce political capital and effort, in, in part because I... In part because I think it's difficult, especially in South Korea, there appear to be significant, you know, uh, lingering, uh, you know, hostility and resentment uh, justified, I think, in, in a lot of ways, uh, certainly not for me to comment, uh, against Japan. But more importantly, because I don't think that trilateral co cooperation is really where the focus is probably most needed right now. Where the focus is most needed is on the military balance with respect to China and, and North Korea. So in the case of Japan, my focus would really be on pushing Japan to accelerate its military development with a focus on the first island chain, the defense of itself and of Taiwan, and supporting South Korea in the event of, a, of an attack by North Korea. And in the case of, North, of South Korea, really focusing on assuming the overwhelming kind of conventional or primary conventional uh, burden uh, for a defense against North Korea, with USFK focused more on the long-term threat from, from China and the ability to employ USFK uh, in a more flexible way, which, you know, I think we've discussed in the past. But I think that is where, so I'm a little bit concerned that there's been a lot of investment in this trilateral relationship at the leader level, but I have yet to see really concrete results in this most important area. And I don't want to be churlish or critical just because it's an administration of a different party. I think this is a good thing, but I'm a bit concerned that it's, it's sort of, we're seeing the optics and the photo op as the result rather than saying, okay, how has this improved the military situation beyond what we should expect anyway? Yeah, I fully agree. I think emphasis on, on security and the military aspect is very important. Um, I, I do hope it's coming. Uh, and I would say, though, that uh, who's invested the most political capital in this uh, is really President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida. I mean, I think it's been, uh, you know, from a from U.S. perspective, kind of low-hanging fruit because President uh, Yoon made a decision uh, to really improve relations with Japan. And I think that's to all of our mutual benefit. Uh, so, uh, but I, I fully concur that uh, all three countries, we really uh, need to work on, particularly Japan, improving its military capabilities. Uh, and um, and as, as Mr. Colby said, we've got to be able to deal with the multiple contingencies. Uh, and But I believe that together, 
the three countries are going to be in a better position to do that uh, rather than without the trilateral cooperation. Mr. Colby, it's been argued that the United States cannot afford to have China and Russia as enemies at the same time when there are so many global challenges. But in reality, as of now, Russia and China are, in effect, enemies to the United States. Is this a diplomatic blunder on the side of the U.S. government? Well, it's just objectively a disaster for the United States. I mean, it's a truism of U.S. statecraft that we don't want Russia and China to be on the same side. I'm not saying it's really our fault. I'm, it's not our fault that Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. However, we are where we are. So if we're looking at the results of statecraft from the U.S. perspective, which is what matters, it's a disaster. Unfortunately, I think there's very little prospect of splitting Russia and China, uh, in the, at least in the near term. So, I mean, they're being quite agile and tying us down. I mean, we expended an entire year, year's w worth of critical munitions shooting at the Houthis in Yemen. I mean, how, how, how agile are we if we expend critical munitions for a China fight against a group of people in Yemen and basically had very little impact. So un unfortunately, I think you know, the prospects for significant increases in defense spending in this country are low. I think it's possible that you could get some increase in the defense spending. The Biden administration is not proposing a defense spending increase for this year. And the two-year budget agreement has a cap on defense spending. That could change in a future administration. But you know, uh, the, the debt to GDP ratio in this country is such that there are real macroeconomic fiscal problems with increases in defense spending. Um, so a lot of this is going to have to be our allies, particularly our allies, unlike South Korea, that have neglected their security responsibilities, Japan and the European allies in particular. That's the best way. Uh, and the US will, I think, need at some point, we will in inevitably have to focus more on China and the Pacific. And that's going to include a more uh, limited role in a, in, a, in a potential conflict against North Korea, because it's true that we can't ignore that North Korea and China are working together. But the problem is precisely that it's likely they'll work together to distract us. So we are going to have to be more focused in not getting distracted by secondary threats for us, like North Korea. Unfortunately, North Korea is not a secondary threat for South Korea. And this is the problem of this. Our interests are not precisely aligned. I think we are a very close alliance. We are, we are fated to be allies. We should be allies. But we need to recognize that our interests are not perfectly aligned and adapt our alliance to deal with that reality and the military and geopolitical and fiscal reality that we face. A lot of threads to pull, but just, just one point, Colonel Maxwell, isn't it just the evolution of geopolitics that China and Russia and North Korea and all these authoritarians decided to team up together more than a U.S. blunder? Uh, well, yes, I think, I think that's true. And I think that's what Mr. Colby is saying as well. It's not our fault per se. I mean, yes, we made some mistakes and, and uh, you know, we can point those out. But I think, you know, these four uh, malign actors, rogue nations, revisionist powers are acting in their own interests. Uh, and they see opportunities. Uh, they see opportunities uh, with us being distracted around the world. And they see opportunities in their cooperation to create those dilemmas to us. So I don't blame the United States, uh, per se. I, I really think they are acting in their interests. And their interests are as Mr. Colby said, in many ways, are more aligned uh, th than ours are. Where I blame the United States is in not sufficiently alarming and waking up our allies to the gravity and the reality of the situation, and that contra what the President of the United States says, we cannot do everything. We do not have the military for it. We do not have a two-war military. And we are not going to have big defense spending increases. That does not mean that we give up. To the contrary, you don't want to live under North Korea. We don't want to live in a Chinese-dominated world. You don't want to live in a Chinese-dominated Asia. But we must understand the urgency and the gravity of the situation and that the old shibboleths, the old you know, religion, is not working anymore. Well, Mr. Colby does have great insights, but I do know for a fact that there is a school of thought in Washington that U.S. still can take a lot of these challenges and take on and still has that power. So on that note, we will wrap up here. Colonel Maxwell, Mr. Colby, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. May I just say uh, today is March 1st, uh, Independence Day in Korea to all our Korean friends. Uh, wish them all the best and hope to to see President Yoon's vision uh, that was in his address today uh, come to fruition, a free and unified Korea, a united Republic of Korea, you are OK or you rock. All right, you rock. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching. We'll be back here next week with U.S. experts to discuss the two Koreas and the region right here from Washington.